This book is a uh, Mises Institute project. It arose uh, out of the uh, cooperative effort of the staff of the Institute, who thought it was uh, uh, a timely to uh, bring together in one source uh, some of the classic uh, works uh, defending the pure time preference theory of interest. So the book uh, contains articles by uh, Murray Rothbard. It has an excerpt uh, from Human Action by uh, Ludwig von Mises. Uh, it has two uh, articles by Roger Garrison and one by Israel Kirzner. Uh, we, we thought also that this was uh, timely because uh, interest rate uh, theory is becoming more uh, widely uh, debated. And there has been uh, a renewed interest uh, in particular in uh, the pure time preference theory. Uh, it's uh, suffered some uh, criticism uh, as of late that I'll mention in a minute. <clears throat> so let me just uh, outline the uh, thrust of the uh, pure time preference theory in the context within which the, uh, what I'll call the older debate took place, in, in which uh, Kersner and Garrison and uh, Rothbard and Mises are all writing in defense of this view. Uh, so I would put the uh, case this way, the pure time preference theory uh, simply applies the Misesian theory of pricing to the uh, determination of the intertemporal price of money. And uh, to think in uh, most uh, uh, succinct uh, way about uh, Mises' theory of pricing, what Mises argues is that we as human beings have preferences, so all action stems from our judgments of value that we make in our minds. <clears throat> and from these preferences, we then uh, are motivated to act. And some people wish to, because of their preferences, uh, acquire a good through purchase and others to sell the good. They have reverse preferences. And the price uh, emerges that clears the market. So it depends upon the intensity of demand relative to supply. And in this formulation, uh, Mises insists and this is really the crux of the pure time preference theory of interest. Mises insists that preferences are the cause that sets in motion the determination of price. In response to this uh, claim that, uh, well, what about objective circumstances? Aren't uh, preferences conditioned by objective circumstances? Mises uh, said as far back as the theory of money and credit in 1912 that no, no, this is not the correct way of viewing human action. It's actually our mental judgments that determine the influence of objective circumstances upon our actions. So, and these preferences are not, uh, we can't go back to some other prior cause before them in human understanding. They are the first cause in the sequence of cause and effect. So the pure time preference theory simply takes this insight and applies it to the uh, question of the intertemporal price of money. So the argument, again, just in sketch says, we have time preferences. We have a preference for a sooner satisfaction of an end as opposed to a later satisfaction of the same end. And because of this, we act upon these preferences. Some people with higher time preferences uh, being willing to uh, borrow present money in exchange for future money. Some people with lower time preferences uh, being willing to lend at, at a particular uh, interest rate to these high time preference people. And then just like in regular markets, the market clears uh, depending on the intensity of uh, time preference, the higher time preference people uh, cooperating with the lower time preference people. Uh, with respect to the objective circumstances then that everyone agrees have something to do with the setting of the interest rate, right? just like everyone agrees that objective circumstances have something to do with the price of apples or the price of gasoline, the pure time preference theory says that the particular influence of these objective circumstances is determined by the, determined by the judgments of our, of our minds, just as it is in the general case uh, of pricing theory. Uh, as Roger Garrison likes to put it, um, the interest rate is determined by time preference alone, right? emphasizing this point. <clears throat> okay, now, now let me set this uh, in the uh, debate, uh, the context of the debate, and uh, I'll use the phrases here, uh, the older debate and the newer debate. Uh, the older debate that was taking place uh, within the context of these articles that were written, and then the newer debate that uh, is addressed in the introduction to the uh, 
volume. <clears throat> so in the older debate, in thinking about the schematic I've given you, there was one view that said objective circumstances alone determine the interest rate. This is the productivity theory of interest. It was held by a number of uh, writers that uh, Boom Bavork uh, attacked on this point. This, by the way, the analog of this in regular price theory and general price theory would be a cost of production theory. So th these are similar in uh, approach. Uh, a second uh, alternative is, uh, is the view that time preference and objective circumstances, say the productivity of capital, mutually determine the interest rate. They have mutual independent causal effects on the interest rate. This again is like the mutual determination theory of Alfred Marshall. Uh, and so again, uh, Boom Bobwork uh, effectively criticized this view. Uh, the third view is that objective circumstances like the productivity of capital or uh, other uh, uh, of these objective things <clears throat> affects the interest rate independently but through time preference. This is a somewhat more subtle view. This is the view that uh, Boom Bobwork and Fisher had of, uh, of, uh, of the interest rate. But again, if you think about this in terms of the general theory of pricing, uh, Mises' general theory, we see right away that we would not accept this. We would not accept that there's some necessary determined independent effect of some objective factor when it changes as it filters through my mind and, and leads to my action. No, 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 we, we think just the reverse, right? We think that whatever the objective circumstances are, it's the judgment of our mind that determines the influence that those objective factors have on my action. <clears throat> uh, by the way, it, uh, when we think about how we do the analytics of price theory, and the same with the time, uh, pure time preference theory of interest, we can, we can, of course, with Sater's Paribus assumptions, do an analysis where by holding everything constant, like the preference rank constant, we can see what the influence of uh, changes in objective circumstances would be, Sater is paribus, but that's not, right, that's not the same thing. That's an analytical technique, right? That's not an argument about uh, what is the causal factor behind price or behind the rate of interest. Okay, so the pure time preference theory then could be uh, put in this manner, uh, given the way I've stated these other alternatives, <clears throat> that objective circumstances have a dependent effect, an effect on the interest rate that depends upon the judgment uh, uh, that the uh, actors make uh, in their minds ab about these things. The view of Mises, of Rothbard, of uh, uh, Kersner, Garrison, uh, and Frank Fetter that I want to uh, turn to now. Now, in the, <clears throat> excuse me, in the newer debate, that's taken place in the last uh, decade. Uh, this debate has been upon the uh, question of semantics uh, in the writings of uh, Mises and Rothbard in particular in expressing the pure time preference theory. It hasn't been a debate upon the substance of the theory, so to speak, but just upon logical conundrums that seem to arise because of the semantics that uh, were used by Mises and, uh, and Rothbard. <clears throat> and here, as I uh, uh, try to point out in the introduction, it's really Frank Fetter's work that's the corrective. Frank Fetter actually had a much sounder uh, semantic uh, expression of the pure time preference theory than, uh, than either Mises or, or Rothbard. And <clears throat> what, uh, one of the reasons this hasn't been noticed is because uh, Fetter laid this out in his 1904 book, Principles of Economics, that almost none of these other authors read. Uh, when they cite Fetter, when uh, Mises cites Fetter, when Rothbard cites Fetter, they always cite his 1915 book, which isn't a new edition of the 1904 book. It's a totally different book. It's uh, uh, economic principles. And the book, uh, as Fetter explains in the introduction, was written to address applied questions, whereas the earlier book is his theoretical treatment. And in the 1904 book, uh, Fetter solves the uh, problems that have been raised in this debate <clears throat> by insisting that time preference must be defined just like we define preference in terms of mental judgments of value. What's fundamental is the ends that we have, the satisfactions that we obtain through one course of action, 
uh, relative to another, and not the goods. The goods come in the next step of the argument, right? So we have ends, and then we have means, and the value of the means comes from the value of the ends. So if, if we want to uh, begin at the beginning, we have to begin with satisfactions, with uh, preferences, evaluation. And so uh, uh, Fetter uh, points this out. And then he says, <clears throat> when we think about the way in which we value uh, goods at different points in time, they can have different, what I'll call temporal value. So a good could have a, a given good, like a barrel of oil, could have a different value today as opposed to six months from today because people anticipate that the conditions of demand and supply in six months will be different. And what emerges in trade from this are forward prices, futures markets, and so on. And as we all know, futures prices can be either higher than, than spot prices or lower or the same. Because, because we're not dealing with intertemporal movements here. We're dealing with temporal placement, temporal use, the moment in time when we wish to use the thing. It can have a different value. So Fetter points out that this is not true of money, that money we can engage in a pure intertemporal exchange because money is the medium of exchange and, and therefore doesn't have these different uh, consumer goods uses or producer goods uses that vary with circumstances. <clears throat> uh, so with money, when we trade it intertemporally, present money for su uh, future money, we're trading just on the basis of sooner satisfaction and later satisfaction. We've isolated this time preference element in the, in the intertemporal uh, structure of, of, the, of the interest rate. And it's this uh, point that uh, answers uh, some of the semantic uh, difficulties that have been uh, raised. <clears throat> okay, at this point, I'll just say thank you to the uh, Institute uh, for this project. I think it's a very worthwhile uh, project, and I hope it uh, adds significantly to uh, the debate on time preference. So do I take questions, Mark? Uh, any questions? Yes. Have you discovered any natural interest rate around which things can rotate? <clears throat> um, yeah, that's a that is a problematic uh, issue. Um, Fetter and and these other uh, uh, pure time preference theory economists don't they tend not to discuss the notion of a natural rate in the in the sense that we would have say a a normal um, rate of profit or something of the sort. The natural rate is somewhat more of a, an equilibrium kind of imaginary construct than it is a theoretical type. And, and so you won't find much of that discussion in, in the discussion of the pure time preference theory itself because it's not really trying to deal with that particular uh, issue. That usually comes up in the theory of, of the business cycle or some... Uh, you know, more complicated uh, theoretical apparatus. Yes? Is there any distinction to be made between uh, <clears throat> Fetter's approach to time preference and that of uh, Woodley Bonnese? <clears throat> I argue that the uh, only difference is semantic. Uh, Mises, I, I think, uh, has been properly criticized uh, for not hewing entirely to the uh, Fetter definition uh, of defining time preference in terms of satisfactions. Uh, both, both Mises and Rothbard in some places seem to define time preference as the uh, preference for present goods over future goods. As soon as you do that, you, logical contradictions uh, turn up, but precisely on the grounds that I mentioned before. We, we, have, we have a difference in temporal value of goods, and so when we trade, when we're engaged in future trade, futures markets or forward prices, uh, uh, the uh, present prices aren't always uh, commanding a premium, right? The, the futures prices can uh, be higher or lower or the same. And so, and so this seems to create, okay, so what, what then is the ar argument about time preference within the context of this, of this mixing of these elements together? And it's Fetter, and only Fetter that I found, that really separates the two elements, the temporal from the intertemporal. He calls this time value, the temporal, and time discount, the uh, intertemporal. Uh, yes? Uh, 
It, it's in, uh, I uh, mentioned it in my introduction. We do not have an excerpt from it. Uh, we excerpt uh, a, a famous Fetter article from the Rothbard collection on uh, capital and interest. Uh, because it, it was uh, set in the context of the debate. He's talking about Fisher. Uh, he, uh, Fetter in this article um, evinces uh, astonishment that Fisher is not a pure time preference theorist. He, he thought he was. He thought he was on his side in the debate. And this is where we get to that third alternative I was mentioning before, this kind of subtle view that Boom Barbrook and Fisher had that objective factors have an independent effect on interest rate, but only through time preference. And, and it took a while for Fetter to understand then that Fisher's view was different from his. Okay, yes, one more. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, the pure time preference theory only purports to explain what we call the pure rate of interest, the, the difference in uh, the value of a present satisfaction given the same satisfaction in the future. And so the other components of the market rate of interest, like a, like a uh, price premium or uh, uh, you know, an entrepreneurial element or whatever it might be. We have to have a different analysis to add all of that in. So I think the pure time preference theory would apply to any mon monetary regime as long as people anticipate that the money in use will still be a medium of exchange in the future. Uh, th then they can express their intertemporal preferences uh, uh, with this money, and they can also then uh, assess their expectations that its purchasing power will be lower in the future, or that there'll, there's certain riskiness involved in the exchange of monies or, or whatever else they might, uh, they might do in making that trade. Okay, thank you very much.